All right, I'll call this in camera. Committee of the Whole to, to order. Uh, and so just to remind you, the Committee of the Whole, we, uh, we have presentations and discussions. When we open for a discussion, we're also open to questions from the floor, from the audience. Um, and uh, just raise your hand and we'll recognize you. I'll try and keep it in order in terms of who's speaking. All right, and this morning I'm going to be working from my computer, uh, trying to save trees. So if I get a little flustered here, bear with me. I don't have a mouse, so sometimes I make it big and sometimes small. All right, the first item of business is the agenda for the Committee of the Whole. Can I have a motion to adopt the agenda? Councillor Korlick, seconded. We don't need. No, no. All those in favor? Uh, we have minutes <coughs> from the Committee of the Whole meeting from December the 10th. Can I have a motion to adopt those? Councillor Thompson, all those in favor? And uh, down quickly to petitions and delegations. Interfor and Vogue and Fiber Canada presenting uh, basically regarding the flooding. Uh, Jeff and Dan are here. And uh, before I forget it too, Dan, uh, you guys are up. You want to take the table at the side there? Um, a thank you from the ski hill came in to, for the work that's been done at the ski hill by, by uh, uh, Vaughan is it just doing it? Yeah. Thank you very much for that. A gentleman, about uh, 10 minutes, and then we'll open for questions from the public and comments. Um, Brian, Approximately. Yeah, you're good. Yep. <laughs> so I have a, a brochure here. Um, the councillors all get it or not? Uh, they did, I believe. Did. All the okay. councillors got that information. Yep. You Perfect. could give some yeah. to the audience if you wanted to. Okay, just an uh, introduction here. Um, again, my name is Jeff Becker, I'm professional forester and uh, woods manager for Interfor. I look after log supply both for the Grand Forks Mill and the Cassegrain Mill. Um, yeah, and uh, been around, I've lived half my life in Grand Forks and the other half in other parts of the community, from the Soap and Cass and Cassegrain. So I've got a fair bit of experience uh, in this part of the world. My claim to fame is I was a Kentucky Blast board in the, uh, in the overweighty parking lot. Uh, I was born in the 50s and I actually literally was born in Grand Forks. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> there you go. So. Dan, do you want to Absolutely, yourself? yep. Um, uh, thanks very much for having me here. Uh, Dan McMaster. So I'm the fiber manager at Vaughan Fiber Canada over in Midway. I'm also uh, the forest manager for the West Boundary Community Forest, which is scattered throughout, of course, our area here, well over to Westbridge. Uh, as well, I manage the Soyuz Indian Band uh, licenses too, so I wear a number of different hats, but um, I guess uh, today uh, here, um, wearing all three, but we're representing Bog and Fiber Canada. So. And also, uh, Dave Parsons, our mill manager in Grand Forks, is here, Dave's, Dave's here as well, so. Okay, um, I'll just go a little bit over, uh, you know, kind of the impetus of, of why we're doing this. Um, there's been lots of, uh, of course, the flood happened last year, and uh, we acknowledge that and, uh, you know, a difficult thing, and, and, uh, and those things are, are, are lingering effects that uh, are going to take a while to uh, to, to undo and, and to, to fix. Um, and so, you know, we're not we're not downplaying that by any stretch. Um, recognize that that's an issue and, and continues to be for, for lots of people. So, um, but but you know, it's, as well, there's a, bit, a fair bit of what, what we think is misinformation on exactly what happened and how it happened, and we just thought, we know there's a meeting coming up on January 22nd, um, it's going to speak to the issue a bit, um, and we just want to make sure that there's a balanced kind of viewpoint on it, you know, we know we're, uh, there's lots of information out there, and we just want to present some what we think are facts. So, so this, this brochure here, um, if you're free to, to look at it, uh, you know, and I'll speak to it a little bit, is that it's intended just to be factual information, um, I don't think there's too much that's debatable in there. Just want to make that clear that that's that's how we how we view this piece. So um, we know you know just kind of going back to the, to the history of the flood. You know, we know that we had some very unusual weather last year, and uh, you know, that seems like you know a bit of a, a state of our, of our our times these days. We have weird weather, um, you know, climate change, climate factors, um, all the things that are going on there. So you know these are just you know, the the fact that we had 230 percent snowpacks measured at you know government regulatory kind of measuring stations happened and. Uh, and then we had you know, the spell of weather, the way it came, and the way the rains came, and the hot weather came. Um, those things happened. And we, we cited some sources there of, of 
you know, scientists, people, people in the know speaking of that piece, but uh, nevertheless, we know that that happened. Um, we also know that uh, you know, the wildfires occurred on the land base and they seem to be occurring more frequently. Again, it's probably hand in hand with the weather we're having that uh, we've had some, certainly some uh, very dry summers. The last couple have been uh, you know, significantly drier than we've had for a bunch of years. And, uh, and we also, as a result of those, uh, both in Canada and the States, um, in the Kettle River um, um, watershed, we've had impacts and uh, a fair bit of hectares. So the, there's a graph there that kind of just speaks to you know, how many hectares were burned in, in a period of time versus kind of versus the past, and it's significantly more. So um, we know the fires have an, have an impact on hydrology. Um, just maybe as a, as a point, Dan and I are both foresters, but we are not. I don't think either of us would call ourselves experts in hydrology. Um, you know, we rely on experts in, in a lot of our plans to, to make decisions, but you know, we know for a bit about it, but we're not we're not experts per se. The, uh, the next point is just what actually happens in the, uh, in the harvest level um, in, the, uh, in the boundary. And this is, uh, you know, we, we harvest about 3,000 hectares, and that's the, the total forest industry harvests about 3,000. So that's a, that's a factual number. The chief forester, and there's a bunch of detail behind it, the chief forester of the province, um, an appointed person in the province at an ADM level, sets the cut, and, and they determine how much gets cut in the boundary. And, and then companies like Swaga and, and Nature 4, we just follow through with that and, and cut according to that. And BC Timber Sales is, is the same in the same boat. So in combination of all of us, we harvest approximately 3,000 out of a total land base of it, somewhere in the 700. So um, that just gives you a bit of an idea of, of how much gets cut in an annual year. Um, just flipping over on the second part there, you know, as a forest industry, we obviously, you know, are concerned quite a bit about, about wildfires and, and how, you know, how we can manage them and help kind of steer them. Um, and, uh, you know, certainly logging does break up, break up continuous tracts of timber, and it also gives people access to, uh, to fight fires. Um, most fires are still lightning caused, so um, they, don't, they don't happen, you know, mostly by humans, so well, sometimes they do, which is unfortunate, but uh, it's nevertheless, um, you know, roaded, roaded areas gives us the opportunity to, to fight those things, and, and that's typically how fires are put out. We, uh, as, as Inter 4, we are also, uh, you know, quite concerned about sustainable forestry. Uh, we subscribe to a, uh, a certifying scheme, a third-party auditing scheme called the Sustainable Forestry Initiative. Um, it's quite common in North America, and it, again, it just allows us to put our forests on kind of notice. The uh, third party, um, Price Waterhouse, is our, uh, our our auditor, and they come in once a year at least and, and do audits of our operations. <coughs> tell us whether we're kind of making the grade or not. So we get a report card on that. That report, report card is, is public as well. So, And then lastly, um, you know, the, the local impact, obviously, uh, you know, the two mills that we have on the boundary, um, you know, Boggins and Midway and ours in Grand Forks here, um, you know, very important. We create lots of, uh, you know, lots of employment to over 450 uh, jobs that are created between our, our, uh, our harvesting folks out in the woods and then our milling folks in the, in the actual plants themselves. So. Lots of lots of people there that uh, that rely on our business, and uh, we think it's a sustainable business and uh, provides good employment. And uh, as well, you know, it, it's our intent to look after the environment. You know, back to the flood. You know, we're not saying that forestry isn't part of the uh, part of the issue, and, and certainly um, one of the things that we're we're doing as a government and, and industry is looking at, at a bigger cumulative effects, and there's a study going on right now that was implemented about, uh, it's about four months now, um, and, and Ministry Forests are leading it with big BC timber sales and the forest industry, and they're looking at what is the, what is the larger cumulative effects, and, and taking you know, into account the, uh, the U.S. fires that also, we typically don't think of that as being, you know, as, as forestry people, we tend to look at drainages and smaller, smaller creeks, and, and we deal with the watershed and the, and the hydrology within those, um, Typically, you know, governments, it's in government's purview to look at that bigger picture. And, and so that's what's going on right now. It's probably going to take a few more months for that piece to get out. But that will, that will help us and maybe uh, direct some of our future uh, operations, you know, maybe change some things that we're doing, uh, maybe not. But at least it'll give us a better look at kind of what's out there. So, um, Dan, you good? Absolutely. Yeah, thank, thanks, Jeff. I'll take just one minute. I, I, I want to uh, say that in the past, I've had an opportunity to wear a Forester's hat and a Boggan hat and a West Boundary hat here. And, and one thing we talked about last year in a couple of our presentations is communication. And I think it comes along the same vein as to what we're looking at here. Communication between the industry and uh, the, the, um, the public themselves and the local government and whatnot too. 
we've had a real push in 2018 from uh, field trips, which we've taken a number of field trips out to different areas of the boundary, as well as classroom discussions, as well as uh, speaking with clubs and different committees and opportunities like this too. And that's going to not only continue, but it's going to be stronger in 2019. We're doing some amazing things out there, and I think that gets kind of lost from everything from uh, <coughs> small pine eradication to make sure these areas are safe, fuel mitigation, fire risk reduction, um, some things that we're, we're doing with the Southeast Fire Center, introduce species committees. I mean, we have, we're, we're really engaged in there. And when you take somebody out to see some, um, <coughs> some really neat uh, uh, thinnings, some really neat um, approaches to uh, different types of forestry too, it really opens up people's eyes. And so I, I wanted to say that you're, you're gonna see, uh, you know, more and more uh, uh, opportunities for yourselves and uh, for the people in Grand Forks and the Boundary to be able to come out and um, and see some of the work that we're doing and, and answer some of their direct questions as well too. Sometimes in, in forestry we tend to, and in the song of the <coughs> too, our heads are to the ground, we're moving ahead, we're make, keeping people working and keeping things flowing, but um, now we need to make sure that our, our message is, is getting out there too. All right, gentlemen, um, let me pass on one question that was asked at previous meetings. Uh, are you adapting to climate change? Are you uh, are you looking at practices in terms of the possibility that the underlying science before is changing? Uh, yeah, the, the, the short answer is yes. You know, it's a, it's a complicated piece. I don't think we told it from forestry from a forester's kind of knowledge. There's not a lot of information about what we can do. You know, certainly one of the things that uh, is happening is the uh, seed transfer rules. So what we what we plant out there, we replant every hectare that we harvest on but we're certainly bringing species that typically you would think grow you know we typically would maybe plant a Douglas or a, a logical pine in, in a spot now we're looking at much more Douglas fir it's much more uh, kind of drug hardy and, and can handle that sort of thing so trees that are going a couple 300 you know kilometers to the south of us here that's what we're looking at and that's what the scientists are telling us you should think about planting those species uh, in, a, in a bigger percentage than you are right now so that's one piece <coughs> that we're doing. okay and opening for questions Councillor Moslin. Um, <clears throat> yes, thanks, Mayor. And uh, no, no, I still not get it. I'm on, right? Okay. First off, I I would like to thank Interfor, <coughs> especially for all your help this spring. Uh, without your help, the South Ruckle a lot more damage would have occurred. So a, a real thank you to Interfor for their good neighbor policy and for their sharing their equipment and their men and their heart in the flood this spring, okay? This town relies on Interfor, not just for employment, but looking ahead for flood protection. A lot of people, I'm one of those guys who walks are everywhere and I walk below your berm. Actually, every once in a while, I'll sneak on top of it. <laughs> Anyhow, and I realize that even in our future flood protection plans, Interfor plays a big role. So, I got all fingers crossed about Interfor. And the other thing, of course, I want to thank Interfor for is that railroad. Hallelujah. It came back. Yeah, so Interfor plays a big... Uh, 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 the forests are, are important to flood control. I, that, that has to be sorted out. You're quite right, but with science and devotion. But I want to also think that Interfor plays a direct role in the actual machinery uh, or infrastructure of our community and flood protection here. And I look forward to Council does working with Interfor to plan flood response and to plan flood mitig mitigation in the city. Not in the forest, but in the city uh, in, in the future. So I know, I know there's, it, the situation is complicated. I, I, I have lots of questions that I, I, I'd like to ask both about forestry and about that. But I know that we are, you are meeting with our flood recovery teams and uh, I certainly uh, John Council does and the community does uh, appreciate the role that you're playing there and look forward to uh, working with you hard in the future uh, to help mitigate the challenge of climate change in downtown Grand Forks. Thank you. Councillor Thompson and Councillor Corlick. Thank you. Um, uh, I agree with everything that uh, Councillor Mosman said. Forestry is, <coughs> is paramount to the um, maintenance and the, the, the livability of our community. 
But one of the questions I wanted to ask uh, is that when you're driving around or you're up, way up north or whatever, you see these clear cuts. And I think that is probably an issue for, for many people. Um, I, are these clear cuts due to uh, uh, devastation of trees that have to be removed? Or can, can either one of you speak, or both of you speak to that particular issue? I can start. Yeah. Uh, very good point. First thing to recognize is that you, you've got a couple of, of licensees here, but one that isn't represented is, is the BCPS up here, and 44% and of the boundary is actually uh, decisions are made by BCTS. So that's one thing. So it, 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 it may not be our uh, cut blocks. Yeah. Um, uh, the second thing is, is with, with the clear-cut idea, a lot of times what we're doing is, in uh, specific areas here, is we're looking at uh, the, the pine beetle issue. So the susceptibility of a stand uh, is, is something I have tackled and I've had to clear and take a, uh, plant better trees in there, more diverse species and whatnot too. Blowdown events too have occurred in a few different areas up there from June, so we did tackle a couple of <coughs> BCTS areas that required that all to be removed for fuel as well too. Um, some of the other, uh, Jeff, maybe you could touch on a few of the greener for kind of size, but uh, uh, definitely salvaging through uh, forest health and blowdown has been a huge part of those, for sure. Yeah, I mean, click, click it is one of our tools to harvest trees. You know, again, you know, we're mandated by the government to cut the 3,200 hectares of, you know, roughly that, that equivalent of volume every year. That's that's part of our timber supply. So, I mean, we look at ourselves, you know, to some degree as, you know, 100-year-old farmers, you know, because that's the kind of long-term, you know, you know, look that we look at, you know, every, every 100 years or give or take, you know, some trees might be 80, some might be 120, but, you know, generally that's kind of the rotation age from the, the next, uh, you know, the next time we harvest. So, um, you know, it's kind of like growing a garden, you know, on a small scale, they're growing carrots, you know, you tend to kind of mow it all down and to kind of do it and plant a whole new crop. So, you know, some trees are shade tolerant, some trees are not shade tolerant, so some trees like to have full sun and that's the only way they survive and do well versus <coughs> trees can survive in partial cuts. So, if you partial cut, um, if you're going to harvest, you know, X amount of wood every year, you would double the amount of area you're going to, you know, if you took 50% out, you would double the amount of, of hectareage of area that you're actually, you know, harvesting in a given year. So, you, you know, if you clear cut something, you're, you're concentrating one one thing. If you partially cut it, you're going to you're going to widen out where you're going to cut. So again, it's a tool, and we can talk about whether clear cutting is good or bad. I mean, I, I know a lot of people don't like the looks of it, um, but you know, we can go on a field trip this summer, we can look at, you know, clear cuts that are one-year-old versus 10-year-old versus 20-year-old, and, you know, I think people's viewpoints, you know, tend to change. Yeah, it always looks like a bomb went off, you know, in the first, you know, the first year. Um, but maybe if we helped explain kind of what's going on there, that might make it, that might make it make more sense. Councilor Corley, um, oh, you just have to follow, follow up. Yeah. <clears throat> so when you do clear cut, do you replant in that particular area? Absolutely, we're mandated to plant 100% of what we cut. So every single thing gets everything, you know, thing that we harvest on gets gets planted every spring. And I know uh, we had a discussion with the regional district last week about how we probably don't do a great job. Back to Dan's comment about communication, you know, that, that that we do that, and you know how we communicate, you know, how we actually reforest, and, and what you know the intensity that we put into that. That's very, very, you know, big part of our, our business. So, Councilor Corley. Usually I don't use this because I have a big voice anyways. <laughs> but I am from Central BC and I have seen the um, results and consequences of the pine beetle. I have, um, in the years that we were there, you could see the mountains turning red from the pine beetle. And, and I know what was not done to do any prevention or <coughs> possibility of things like that. So, what we knew was going to happen if they weren't um, cut down, harvested, there was going to be a huge fire. And that's what happened this past year. And it was just, to me, it was just amazing that there was not more devastation done by the fires. The whole uh, scheme of um, harvesting and processing everything, once it becomes a pine beetle kill, changes. And I mean, it has to be harvested within a short period of time to make it of any value whatsoever. So I guess what I'm really asking is, what do, you, what is being done to prevent the pine beetle coming here? Is it the different species of pine that is slowing it down here, or 
what you're aggressively doing to prevent that developing. We're fairly fortunate here compared to the north where they have, you know, large tracks, you know, hundreds of, you know, you know, know tens of thousands of, of kind of continuous, you know, blocks of logical pine. So when that, when that pine beetle got going and the populations of bugs got going to, you know, epidemic proportions, you know, they kind of mowed across vast tracks. Well, we're, we're fortunate we've gotten bro broken up by partly topography, we've got mountains and things like that in there. We also have, you know, other species like fir. Um, you know, there's some deciduous up here, you know, we've got a little bit of cedar in some of the wetter areas and some of the, you know, spruce in some of the, in the wetter spots as well. So our, our you know, the good thing about being in this part of the world is that it's broken up, but we have much more diversity of species. So it's just naturally kind of more, more resilient to that, that piece. So we don't have that. So we don't have, so that's one piece. And then the other piece is we've actually been fairly aggressive over the past, I'll say, 40 years or so, both government and industry have tried to get ahead of the beetle because we saw it happening up there and we tried to harvest that, that pine before it got dead and, and <coughs> done. So you don't see you know, big, vast tracts of land out there with dead pine on. You actually see very, very little of that in this part of the world. So we're actually in a lot better shape from, from as compared to the market. Um, Councillor Zielinski, is there any questions from the floor that people are interested in asking at this point? No, okay. Oh, Les? It's okay, I'll let you guys finish. Councillor Zielinski. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I've got a couple of questions for you. Um, first of all, your brochure. Um, wildfires on the land base, you have wildfires in the Kettle Valley watershed. Does that include the states? That, does that include from Big White all the way until it dumps into the Columbia? Where, where does that go? Yeah, yeah, that's the whole, we, we tried to capture everything and we could. You know, I think the biggest one in the states was the stick pin fire from a couple years ago and we tried to incorporate that one as well. So our intent was to capture the whole watershed both in and out of the, of the states, yes. Yeah, um, so then on the graph below that you have the, uh, what you've been cutting. Um, how does that relate to the watershed? Like uh, I believe the boundary area is just a small part of that watershed. Like, do we know how much it has been cut in the watershed itself? You know, this, these numbers are definitely for the boundary itself. So, is there, I'm just got to, I'm trying to answer your question, is there any, you can ask myself, is there any hectares outside of the boundary that's not in the Kettle River watershed? And I don't know if there is any that's outside. It would be a very small amount if there was. It's pretty, you know, pretty much the boundary is the Kettle. You know, everything <coughs> flows from Big White all the way down into the Kettle. Um, I'm not sure if there's a little bit on the fringes. Sometimes administrative boundaries don't always found and follow watershed boundaries, but for the most part, I think yes, you can you can probably assume that that's kettle. I can confirm that, but I think that those those hectares would pretty much equate to the Kettle River, um, you know, that the outside you know fringe of the of the uh, watershed. So. Um, this one will be easy for you guys. It's not so easy for yourself. Um, your documentation, your reports, your plans. Can you just walk me through the hierarchy? Um, operation plan is beyond the ground stuff as opposed to all the other plans. Can you just step and play them out for me, please? Go for it. Okay, so, I mean, we, we could talk, you know, at a high level when I talked about the chief forester, you know, right now it's, it's a she and, and she set the cut, you know, and so that's that's kind of our overarching <coughs> plan that dictates how much cut gets, gets happens in the boundary. So there's two there's two licenses there's um, two big licenses and lots of little ones so there's a uh, tree, tree farm licenses there's forest licenses and then there's woodlot and community forest so that's kind of the, the main ten years and then of course private land on top of that so so she sets the cut on the government uh, government regulated land and she doesn't deal with private land so that that kind of that kind of tells us what we actually have to cut um, and then there's regulations like the uh, you know forest practices uh, regulations that, that dictate how we you know it, it, it's quite a long detail. It, it, I'm not sure I can answer it. Kind yeah, of, maybe okay. I'll, I'll just refine the question. As far as um, information to uh, municipal bodies like the RDKB and ourselves, yeah. uh, what documents do you send us to review? Uh, like the last one I saw was an operational plan, and there were a couple other plans ahead of that, long range plans. I think what gets referred out is a forward stewardship plan. Okay. So that's that's a plan that we do every five years, and uh, and that, that that encompasses what what all the activities that, that each of us as licensees would do in the five year period. 
Um, that you wouldn't get the actual detailed plan of what our loggers would get, but that would that would kind of say, hey, that's why we send referrals out. We say, hey, we're going to go in this area. Maybe we have some uh, fur bark beetle that we need to deal with, or, or sal fire salvage or something. That's the kind of plans that we refer out to you in the forage stewardship plan. I'll, I'll just add to that, Councillor, is, is um, you know, the, the West Boundary Community Forest, uh, a little bit of a different tenure, it's a community forest, and uh, on a much smaller scale. So we have uh, just established our uh, forest stewardship plan, which, which did uh, get uh, referred out and, uh, the, to the regional district and a number of different entities. And we made some changes, we've established that now. And in that forest stewardship plan for the West Boundary Community Forest, we did establish uh, we're going to be looking much more at a permit to permit basis referrals as well too. Uh, one can you'll receive packages as to where these different projects are headed, uh, what, what we're looking at doing, our objectives and our timing. As well, of course, you can always check westboundarycommunityforest.com and on there we, we list out all, I think the, um, I don't want to say the more uh, simple documents because that makes it, uh, dumps it down because there still are um, you know, official documents, but that, that definitely is an area that you'd be able to check to see what's happening in the West Boundary Community Forest. Remember, we do have a small amount of permits compared to what Interfor does, so, uh, so that's not <laughs> that's not saying that they're uh, negligent in what they're doing because they, they have great communication as well too, but I think there's some opportunities for us to inform uh, the public as to what's happening as well. Okay, gentlemen, thank you very much for your presentation. Oh, just a second, I, I thought there was another sign. <coughs> Mr. Johnson. Just a couple of questions. Les Johnson, GFTB. Um, <coughs> I, I know the meeting at, uh, coming up on the 22nd will probably have to be concerned because it's pretty negative towards the forest industry from what I understand. Uh, I just wanted to give you a chance to address some of the specific things that I'm pretty sure people who are putting on that meeting and attending that meeting are concerned about. Uh, so first off, uh, they they don't really like the forest practices in terms of uh, clear cutting and road building for logging practices. They feel that, first off, uh, clear cutting exposes an awful lot of area and that increases the speed of the snow melt in the springtime. Uh, could you address that and what your take on that is? I'm giving you that chance right mm -hmm. here. So. Yeah. Oh, <clears throat> well, one thing I could say, uh, Les, is that it, it, it's a great, it's really the crux of, 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 of a lot of the, uh, on the 22nd and, and beyond. Right. I think on the 22nd, uh, I know myself, I'm looking forward to going as a citizen of Grand Forks as well as a forester as well to, to, to listen and to, and to hear about uh, the concerns and to learn from uh, the experts that will be there too. Um, I, I definitely have, uh, I think, a lot of uh, individual opinions that I probably would, would, would press that for a different uh, time, so I did have the time, uh, time to explain a little bit more. Um, uh, uh, the unknown is, is a big thing. I think, I think someone to stand up here and say they know exactly how those two relate is, is, uh, would be unfair, but I do know that uh, through the cumulative effects uh, um, uh, project and study that's going on, as well as um, uh, even ourselves being, uh, learning a little bit more about it, could answer that a little bit better. Is that, is that fair to say, Jeff? Yeah. The other uh, the comment make less is that um, I, I've been around enough hydrologists enough to know that definitely clear cuts increase the amount of snow it, it, because you don't have the snow interception and you kind of, you kind of tends to break that snow down and it melts and it goes back in the atmosphere easily. So you get more snow with a clear cut. Um, and so you do potentially get more rapid uh, snow melt because it's in this big area that, that can, you know, A, there's more, there's more water, there's more snow there and it, and it can melt quickly. Um, in certain drainages, I've certainly had hydrologists look at drainages and say, and sometimes it, it, it's better to actually have you know it broken up and having clear cuts because it it, uh, it changes the synchronicity. So basically, the timing of when a different drainage or when parts of the drainage melt off. And so you know, there's some drainages that are sensitive, and you don't want it all to melt off at the same time. Other times, depending on the layout of the drainage and the complexity of the topography, you know, it's actually beneficial to to take certain areas and, and actually put a clear cut there from a from a hydrological point of view. Not necessarily for any other reason, but so there's it, it's not a it's not an easy exact science that says every clear cut is going to do a bad thing necessarily. Sometimes it actually can do a good thing. So okay. Um, next part of that, um, in the uh, people who came before the flood recovery teams uh, in public meetings, uh, especially earlier in the summer, there was a, a number of people who brought up the idea that. The rivers are, have silted up a lot more because of logging operations in the forest, basically increasing the 
silt flowing into the actual streams and then going down streams making the rivers shallower. Therefore, when a pulse comes down, it spreads out faster. How about that? Your chance to address that. You know, I don't have any facts to, to okay. say one way or the other. Okay. You know, there's, there's you know, certainly, you know, with the with our regulations that we do, you know, we have to stay away from creeks, you know, depending on how big, big the creek is, depends on how big the reserve is and, and the management zone around the creek. So there certainly is, is, uh, is, is things that we do differently than we probably did, <coughs> probably that we did kind of 30 or 40 years ago. When, you know, unfortunately, back in the 50s and 60s, people would drive down creeks because it was the easiest place to drive a cat or a skitter down. Um, so there's certainly some practices that from the past that, we're probably still living with to some extent. I um, mean, you know, those are there. Road building, I think somebody mentioned road building is, a, is a, an issue. And certainly ro good road building practices and poor road building practices, um, you know, they can, have, they can have a lot of impact, you know, just in terms of managing culverts and bridges and those sorts of things. So. Okay. So when roads are put into the forest, um, are, are, is there somebody that come, basically checks that you're doing it by good practices as opposed to bad practices? I'm, I'm just curious how that works. Is there any regulatory framework in place? Yeah, absolutely there is, so okay. that, that looks at that. So government, government probably better to speak to that, but certainly they, they monitor our activities and whether we've done a good job or not. So. Okay, so and one for me personally, nothing to do with flooding, but uh, summer's coming. And we all worry that we're gonna have everything burned down around us. Um, <clears throat> so a while back, uh, I was given to understand by a conversation with somebody that deciduous trees, when, the, when there's a, a wildfire progressing through an area, when it hits the broadleaf deciduous trees, it slows down or nearly stops because they're not as much of a fuel as pine and fir, etc. Um, and they said that apparently, according to some people, and I don't know for sure, the practice within BC is that you want the money trees, the government has basically said you want the money trees, which are the ones you can harvest, and basically you're going to spray and kill off the deciduous trees to make room for money trees. Is that true? To, to, get, to get rid of the deciduous? Yeah. yeah. No, I don't. I don't. Okay. I would say no. Okay. <laughs> That's just kind of like yeah. to yeah. settle an <coughs> argument with me and somebody right. else. The, the deciduous tree provides uh, a, a lot of um, stratification as right. the stand grows up. It provides uh, annual leaf litter, which right. has definitely helped with the biomass itself there. Okay. And uh, even if, if you know if one would turn around and all of a sudden put the the uh, trembling aspen as a high value tree, I'm not going to say that conversation would be any different. <laughs> but uh, as of right now, there's there's uh, you know when we talk about money trees, these trees are the ones who are the being left in many yeah. areas there too. Yeah. It's it's fuel on the ground and, and ladder fuels and small logs. I mean, that's the two mills you have here uh, in Boundary uh, are small log mills. I mean, that's, right. that's it. The inner four goes to 18 inches and we're to 14. So we're not targeting um, deciduous and we're not targeting massive trees at all either. So that covers it, Les? Yeah, that covers it. Yeah, three good questions. And I think clearly we've defined the whole issue here in terms of the fact that forestry does play a role. Sir, in the back, identify yourself. Yeah, Barry Jarvis, Mr. Mayor. Uh, just one comment or brief question, gentlemen. <coughs> My sense is that the amount of clear cut that occurs in the Kettle Valley watershed is an extremely small proportion to the total watershed. Would that be a fair statement? And that's what these, these the graph on the bottom is trying to portray that that it's you know it's the 3,200 uh, 3,200 hectares a year gets cut in the Kettle River you know out of a total of 700 and some. Thank so you. Relatively small. I'll give you a copy of the pamphlet if you like. Thank you. I was late coming. Right. I apologize. Yeah. A quick question. We need to move on, Councilor. Yes. <coughs> thanks, Mayor. And uh, thanks, gentlemen. <coughs> Just a quick question. There is an assess of per you, local forest managers and provincial government, are working together to do a cumulative effects assessment because we have been logging this area 100 years. Uh, uh, um, when is that assessment due? It's government's time frame, but I, I'm kind of thinking in the next three months or so. Oh, good. So, so it's coming up fairly soon that we'll have some, you know, some, you know, and I, I suspect it will probably ask more questions that it won't answer everything. And we will we will kind of carry on with some more on the ground stuff in the summertime with a, with a, some more hydrology people that, that are expertise in that stuff. So okay, thank you very much, Mayor. Thank you, thank you, gentlemen. That was great, and I think we have hit the critical issues here. And I appreciate you getting out in front of this at this point. So thanks for that. Uh, looking forward to many more communication talks. Thank you. All right. <coughs>
I'll leave some copies here for very in it. <coughs> Morning, Roly. Thank you very much for coming to the meeting. We're at that section where uh, I've got a couple of. Uh, I should go on speaker here. Should I? Let's try. Can I be there? Yes. Yeah. So yeah, a couple of items that I'd like to cover, um, and so the first one will be uh, introduction of Catherine Speechley, who is here today and is going to give us a short report on the warming center activities uh, and the second is to generally discuss the budget and the fact that you and I are the only people who vote on it so I think there's a need for us to discuss that but uh, first let me introduce Catherine uh, Catherine comes to us at a really lucky time uh, Everett Baker you know stepped aside uh, for personal reasons which I totally understand and Catherine stepped into the breach in terms of getting something going here in our town uh, for shelter. Um, she comes from a background of working in nonprofits all her life, which is probably why she's poor. So, um, she has been a dedicated uh, community worker at various levels, including management. So, welcome this morning, Catherine. Is this on? I have to press the little red button there. So, yes, I. Is that on? Yep. Okay, thank you. And thank you to Mayor Taylor and councillors for inviting me this morning. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, I was not born in a grocery store or parking lot here in Grand Forks, and, um, and I hope you don't hold that against me because I am here in Grand Forks because I made a choice to move to Grand Forks. My husband and I retired about four or five years ago, and we spent three years driving the Kootenays, camping, staying in motels and deciding where we wanted to move to. We wanted something new. So we actually did that crazy thing and thank you, oh, gentlemen. Left, we left Vancouver Island. I know, I know what you'll say about that, but we did. We made the choice to come here. And we are very happy to be here in Grand Forks. One of the reasons we moved here was because um, <clears throat> we both wanted to be involved in nonprofit things and to spend some time in in, in making Grand Forks a place where we wanted to stay. So the Warming Center kind of dropped into my lap, and it, and it really did. It dropped into my lap in a lot of the ways that it dropped into everyone's lap here in town. But it emerged from a response to the cries of community members who wanted to house the homeless for the cold winter months and to meet the needs of the hungry and the homeless in Grand Forks and the surrounding area. In fact, anyone really is welcome to drop in at any time in the day say hello to staff and volunteers, play some cards, have a coffee, and meet your neighbors. And I have to say right off the bat that our budget is comprised mainly of monies supplied to us by BC Housing. But there are some private donations, and they are pouring in hour by hour, actually, to tell you the truth. We have trained and compassionate staff in place. And, and we, are, we are temporary. We are. We have a 100-day... 100-day contract from BC Housing uh, and really this program really came about from for me seeing Facebook pages and comments and and concerned citizens crying out for something to happen so we all understand that nothing's going to get done if we just listen to the people who talk 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 on Facebook and we all know that infrastructure doesn't happen overnight for some people the program was a long time coming and to others it was fast and, and at times to me it felt as we were bogged down in red tape and at other times I, I didn't get any sleep for a couple of weeks. I'd wake up making lists on my bedside table hoping I could read my writing in the morning. There was a hundred things that needed to be tended to every day. One of the major things was finding a nonprofit that would quickly take us on. <coughs> we needed a charitable number to receive money from BC Housing. We needed a billing system and a payroll system. And Whispers of Hope stepped in and have been invaluable to me with the work they have done before we were even given a mandate. I am very grateful to Louise Heck and their board. And at this time in making charitable do donations, we ask that people write their checks to Whispers of Hope Warming Center. The Warming Center came, to group, came together really quickly with actively engaged community members from very uh, nonprofit and social service agencies. Those included, but are not limited to, BC Mental Health, 
Public Health, the Ministerial, Habitat for Humanity, Whispers of Hope, the RCMP, and personal citizens, public citizens, and the input and financial support of BC Housing. Matt Cameron, who is my cohort with BC Housing, recently told me that Grand Forks is not at the forefront of dealing with homeless and the hard to house. And I had to ask him that question. I asked, are we, where, where do we sit in this in a city of our size in British Columbia? And he said, in fact, we are lagging behind. We are the only city of our size who do not have anything in place until the warming center opened. And we need to gain an understanding of that. We are not unique. So at this time, we have hired a coordinator who is organizing, supervising, and training four full-time paid staff and additional part-time staff. And she has also hired a uh, volunteer coordinator. All our staff will be trained in various courses required and recommended by BC Housing as seen by best practices. At this time, partnerships are formed with BC Health, Anchors, and South Cork. Soccer College and formal training is happening at least once a week. There is a workshop going on right now. In community training, we thank BC Housing for recognizing in the budget that all staff and volunteering helps the wider community, and I will say a little bit more about that. On the first night opening, there were three sleeping over. Our very first night, we had what you'd call a soft opening if we were a business. We didn't have a splashy cake, we didn't, you know, invite people to come. Um, so, three. Uh, within 10 days, when I wrote this, we're at, we're at about two weeks right now, there were 10 sleeping in, so we are virtually full. We did receive our, um, our building occupancy permit for 10 to sleep, but at any one time, you could walk into the building and there could be 20 in there, sitting around, having coffee, watching television, playing cards, doing crafts, having a bowl of something warm to eat. But everyone is welcome to visit, and the coffee is always on. And I, but, I, but I really need to remind everyone, all of us in this room, that this is home for many of these people. This is their safe place to keep their things and to lay their heads. This is the only place that many of them have where they can come in during the day and put their feet up. And I was thinking about this yesterday afternoon. I, I got home around 1 o'clock in the afternoon. I took my shoes off. I changed my clothes into my jeans. And I laid down on the couch and I just had some time with my cat. And all of us take that for granted, that we can just do that. And these people don't have that space until now. So we ask the visitors, greet staff and sit for a moment, checking in with staff before asking for a tour. Matt Cameron from BC Housing has impressed upon us that there is money in the budget for commercially prepared food. And at least two local restaurateurs have been contacted at this time, excuse me, contracted. Meals are being served and coffee and snacks are offered. Up until this point, a lot of the lunches have been supplied by community members who have prepared food in commercial kitchens. People have also bringing in, are also bringing in fruit and clothing and supplies. The support has been rather overwhelming. Volunteers are being sought and trained, and at this point we have over 100 hours of volunteer hours already donated. That's a rough estimate. We are keeping track, of course, and we'll be reporting that to BC Housing at the end of the program. Members of the public are constantly dropping in with donated supplies, and we are very grateful. And yes, there are, we are, when people are at the center, they are off the street. Just think about that. We understand that our neighbors have concerns. We, we really do. But there are neighbors as well who have gained an understanding that we are trying to make the community as safe as possible. We appreciate their support in this. In addition, we have implemented a good neighbor agreement, which staff, volunteers, and residents sign. And further to this, we are beginning a program of door knocking and introducing ourselves to the immediate neighbors. Specific questions and discussion will be introduced with neighbors given the chance to air their concerns. And some of the people at the warming center may respond to the care we offer, coupled with the care from the community and the helping agencies. But mental illness, head injuries, sexual abuse, all has contributed to where they are today. They may get out from under the cycle of abuse that most of them have experienced in their short lives, but some of them will need support for the rest of their lives. Now, the Warming Center Group, this is a completely separate thing, the Warming Center Group has been asked to begin to look at the formation of a housing society, and we, as a committee, have agreed in principle we would offer support and encouragement to the, set, the setting up of one. At this time, the Warming Center Group is what would normally be called a working committee. Individual members may offer their expertise in specific areas, 
that they will need to make their own commitment as to the level offered. As well, City Council has to say that the society needs to be formed and a visioning process begun on what Grand Forks Housing Society may entail. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. Opening for question. Council. Councilor Thompson. Councilor Croft. Yeah, you have to. Do I? Yeah. <laughs> I need to turn off? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm pleased to hear that you're going to be doing the door-to-door -door, um, with, with the neighborhood. There is one uh, in your area that had a petition. Um, have you received that petition and have you talked to that particular individual to try and allay their concerns? That's a really good question. No, I have not met this person that I know of. Um, I, uh, I have spoken, I, I really love going around to talk to the different people in the community who have asked to speak to me and uh, mostly that's because they're offering some something um, and it causes me to be in a public place to be able to be part of, you know, to be a fly on the wall and to answer questions at the same time. But I have not seen the petition. I did hear about it, a petition. And actually, someone came into the center one day and asked us, well, before we were even set up, if, if I, I knew where she could find a copy of the petition to read it and to possibly sign it. And I said I had absolutely no idea. So, um, no, I have not. And I, I would love to see it because I don't know what it addresses. Councilor Krog. Uh, yeah, you actually answered um, a fair amount of the questions I had here but um, so training is starting yes sir okay in fact the, the interesting thing about training for me is I really pushed that on the budget with BC housing they did not <coughs> offer you know a lot of money up front for that kind of thing and they in fact quadrupled the amount of money that we asked for for our training because they recognized, and I recognize, the training may take place for an individual. Like, like you, Mr. Krog, may go and say, I want to take the Narcon training, which is the training to uh, deal with an overdose of fentanyl. And you are welcome to come and take that training. And I can make available the times of the trainings, although they are happening all the time, every week. So everyone is available to come in and take those trainings. And then that takes that out to the wider community, every volunteer that takes those trainings. Okay, for the two, uh, yeah, um, you mentioned um, <coughs> private donations and that you had a budget from BC Housing. So what's your overall budget for your 100 days? I'm not sure I'm, I'm uh, open to, I'm not sure I can say that. I'm not sure. And I thought about that. I have no problem with telling you the number, but I would tell you privately, Brian, how do you feel about yeah, that? Yeah, I, I don't know whether that should be cleared with your own sub board first before you release it because that figure is changing around as you assign uh, uh, things you're spending. So uh, I would think check back on that and get back to us. I can get that information <coughs> from Councillor Croc. Yeah, no, I just thought the public. Um, I can, I can, yeah. I can address that a little bit. Um, the uh, the about the budget is set, and sure. and I can like any budget. You know, move move amounts around within that budget within the categories. I would never move yeah. <laughs> something from training to food, for example. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but but I have been told by BC Housing and the Minister of Housing that 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 number is set and we cannot increase the number in any way. Of course, we're looking at those hundred days, which takes us to the end of March, and and there there is an opportunity in here if this is done well, that that this program continue. But that would, that would become a, a whole new uh, project, a whole new budget, a whole new application and grant process with BC Housing. Correct. Okay, and then finally, um, I guess um, a question that, and concerns from the neighborhood, and it's about um, drugs and the rules that are in the warming center. So, is there anything being done to address? Can we? Yeah. 
Waiting for the end of your sentence? <laughs> oh, oh, okay. Anything being done to address any potential drug use um, and or disruption? So that's a, that's a question that has a lot of answers and it has a lot of questions involved. So the, the staff is being trained in overdose work and, and we have had one overdose. Um, and all I can say about that is, is uh, I am sure as hell glad that that man was in the center when it happened. Because two staff jumped into action called 911 and two residents saved his life who have been trained in, in all of those processes. Now yes, they all sign an agreement that they will not use drugs in the center. And drugs are not being used inside the building. But, but it's like anywhere. You know, we, we, got a, we got a call the other day that somebody was yelling and screaming at 4 o'clock in the morning. And it wasn't any of our people. Our doors were locked, the center was closed, and everybody was snoring away on their bunks. So, so things happen in the community that are not directly related to us. But, I, but I, will, I, will, I will say, I will be honest with you, of course these young people, some of them are using drugs. But we have a man who was out having a smoke the other day. I went out to talk to him. I said, what, what, is, what are you smoking? He says, tobacco. And I looked at it and sure enough, you know, that's all it was. So we can make assumptions. I made an assumption about this guy. I don't, I don't know any of these people. And I made an assumption that he was out there smoking grass and he, he was not. So I think I understand about the neighbors and drugs and worries, but <coughs> we have been around talking to the businesses already and the businesses are happy that we are in, in the area. Uh, three, three of the businesses, I will say, that we have spoken to. That's all I've spoken to. And they are, they are happy that we are there. They are happy that people are walking with purpose back and forth to the warming center. They're not loitering around. They're not hanging around looking over people's fences. They're not doing any of that stuff. We are really trying very hard to, to engage these, our residents to know that, that this is a neighborhood that they live in, that this is their place and we're asking them to treat it with respect and to treat the neighbors with respect. Thank you, Catherine. Um, can I reiterate something that, that was mentioned and that is that there is some discussion at this point of a housing society because we really don't have a solid plan <coughs> for after March 31st of this year. Uh, we need to put our heads together with the community and uh, I see that responsibility coming from the community in uh, using whatever resources we have to develop our capabilities of having a proper uh, housing society for the region. I think it, uh, it's clearly potential here with the leadership of someone like Catherine, if we don't burn her out, that we could have that sort of help from her. But I think it's going to take a community coming forward to create a strong enough housing society that we can deal with the challenges we have coming up after March 31st. Uh, and further questions, Councillor Thompson. We'll have to keep it moving here. We're at 9:55. Yeah, just uh, just a, a brief <coughs> moment. I'm I'm pleased to hear the people that are sitting around the table, um, uh, as in an advisory capacity, uh, and including RCMP, uh, mental health, hospital, um, and and people that are whose jobs can be directly impacted by the goings on of some of the communities. So, um, uh, and you're in my neighborhood, I live in that area, and I've never heard anything. I stayed with my bedroom window open at night, and I never heard anyone yelling and screaming. So, there you go. All right, thank you. And Councillor Korlick? Just quickly, um, I had the opportunity to have a, a ride around with the security bud Alcott the other, a week ago. It was very enlightening to me. I've been, you know, I'm a fence rider on the shelter and the housing and things like that because I'm just not sure. I'm just not sure. So I was very um, pleased to be able to have a quick tour of the warming center and see that it is a, a, a good facility and that it, when I walked in, it smelled so good because it was brand new. And I thought that was, you know, maybe it had to have some, well, hopefully have some positive effect on the people that are um, guests or whatever you want. I don't know what people that come in. Uh, because, you know, I think it's, I don't know, 
important for people to develop that feeling of this belonging, a sense of community to be part of something, and maybe give them some help to develop that self-respect and respect for other people's things. Because I have a feeling that's you know kind of lacking in some cases because they they don't have a feeling of self worth. I don't know what it is, and I'm just I was really pleased to see things. It was an eye opener to me to have the opportunity to uh, visit different areas of town and and the warming center in that particular um, situation. I think it's in a good location, and I wish you well, and I hope to be you know, learning more all the time about it because that's exactly where I am. And Catherine has uh, agreed to be a second as a liaison to that committee, so I appreciate the uh, support that Catherine is giving. Uh, and we have a question from uh, Patricia. Can you identify yourself, please? Sorry, are you pointing yeah. me out? My name is Pamela Kennedy. Pamela. I am the one that had the petition going. I would like to share information with that. If I need more time. Can you I speak would up a bit, Pamela? Sorry? Speaking My name is Pamela Kennedy. I am the one that did the petition with the time allotted to me. For the number of people that I did talk to, there was an astonishing amount of people that did not know, nor did they know how to find help and they were of uh, concern. This is not my question, I'm just bringing that for it. My first question is, is now that we have, well, okay, when this was established, there was a lack of transparency. And I would like to know, as a paying residential house owner, why that happened. Um, it scares me. Um, the more knowledge is power, and it also relieves some of the, Concerns, um, fears, everything else. My biggest fear is because I do know a lot about the health and pathogens and such that is associated with certain individuals that may attend this setup. Why was not the planning not done prior to setting this up? Why okay. are people- Let me, let me answer that, Pamela. Um, clearly, in the past, and I was involved in the shelter program here for a number of years, we've been prepared and opened the 1st of November. Uh, in this case, we didn't open then, and we didn't open uh, into December, so we were already freezing temperatures and nothing was in place. So I have to apologize for the fact that this was pushed through quickly. In our plans as best as the previous society, we had the plan that when we had uh, located an opportunity where we could move into an area that we'd immediately contact everybody in that uh, local area and work with them. That didn't happen. That all fell apart with the flood. And so this was lost in the shuffle. And uh, as December started coming on and we hit 10, 15 below zero, we still had people sleeping in ditches. So yeah, it was rushed through. Uh, and, and I agree, it would have been nice if we would have gotten out there and had uh, prior contact with the uh, local community people. Okay, so I have questions on pop, uh, top questions, and I don't know what the rules are in this room, how many questions I'm allowed. So please well, stop Well, we set a bad example with counselors who stack up three or four questions and then monopolize the floor. Not that it bothers me. <laughs> However, I, I would like you to keep it quick because we do have okay. a long agenda, but go ahead. I, just questions I want to bring forward. She mentioned, sorry, I'm, I'm really bad with names, Catherine. so sorry. Yep. Um, mentioned that training. That's a big fear of mine. Um, she's only got training going so far, or like just starting it. Where now that you've got paid staff there, is WorkSafe BC included in on that? If, is there any vaccines or anything to prevent these individual volunteers from getting hurt no. or anything like that or coming in close contact with okay. drugs that can possibly hurt We would have liability these. insurance and three of the staff from the previous shelter were hired by Catherine's team. Catherine, did you want to respond for this? Is that on or off? It's on, on now. Okay. okay. Uh, Paula, you know, I, I did see those comments. Sorry, I hate having my back to you. Mm -hmm. I, I did see those comments on the Facebook pages, and I, and I, it was something that, 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 that we took very seriously. But it is an individual's uh, own requirements 
to get vaccinations that they may think they need to live in this world today. So it's, it's a person's individual ideas whether they need to have their tetanus shot, their TB test, uh, whatever else we can have to protect us from people in society. You know, I wear a scarf. I'm a singer, I wear a scarf, I protect my throat. But I also wear a scarf so that I can do this when someone sneezes in my face at the bank. So we can't always protect ourselves from every single thing that we don't even know is coming at us. I don't know how I would protect myself other than uh, rubber gloves, etc. Now, Now, two groups have been in already doing training on cleaning up, on dealing with uh, things coming at you in your face, uh, in, in, a, in actual cl cleaning of the facility at times that are rough, if you can get my drift on that. So that training has happened already. That, and that is happening individually as staff is hired and volunteers are coming on and signing on, signing on their agreements as well. So staff, volunteers, everyone, everyone makes a decision about what sort of vaccination they may they may want but it did but those comments on Facebook did cause me to check back to my own records to see when my last TB test was and when my last uh, tetanus shot was and I went in I drove to Kelowna and had my tetanus shot not that anybody's gonna bite me more that I'm a gardener and I need to deal with things in the backyard so I, I get it and I don't I don't want to I don't want to make that I don't want to belittle that or make that seem less important because it is an important comment but people's individual, people have to take their own uh, time to make the decision about what shots and vaccinations they want to take okay. as a volunteer in the Patricia, session. we're stacking up a bit here. Do you Good. have another question that you wanted to ask before I go on to? I'm sorry, are you referring to me as Patricia? I thought. Pamela. Pamela. Sorry, Pamela. Pamela. Sorry, Pamela. Um, and I'm sorry for trying to try my okay. best. Um, okay, you said to me, safety inside. I live in eyeshot of the building. I, with my job, I am up at, at all hours of the night. I do see people walking in and out, and I have taken pictures, I have filmed it. I was the one that was outside, <coughs> directly across the street. The only thing I didn't do was go up and take a picture because I did not want to put myself in harm's way. I didn't know what to do because it sounded like a drunken conversation, and I didn't know how far it was going to go. It sounded like a, what I would refer to as um, somebody trying to alleviate a issue from developing further. And when I made the comment on Facebook, trying to get a hold of Bud, I, that was the only thing. I'm not going about to waste the police time, our personal emergency responses, for something that should be handled inside a facility as such. Therefore, she said, she mentioned that the door was locked. No, I am sorry. I heard, I could hear the gravel on the snow. I could hear the echoes off the building. I could hear the soft voice of a man talking to a lady that was distraught. Um. So it could not have been down at Hotel 99. So you told me that the door was locked at 1.30. I like to question that because I do see people walking in and out. And if I need to photograph and document further, I will. So please respond. Okay, so the doors are locked at midnight. But that doesn't mean people aren't coming in and out. It does mean that safety is looked at in a different way after midnight. So the doors are locked from midnight till people go out around 7 in the morning for their first smoke of the day. And uh, the doors are locked, but staff open the door. So if you decided that you wanted to walk over at one o'clock in the morning and, and have a coffee because you can't sleep or do anything like that, you're welcome to do that, but you knock on the door and the staff lets you in. And, uh, and that, is, that is for the safety of everyone. That is, then we know who's in. People have signed in. They have uh, had a shower, gone to bed, let me had take coffee. This one. Uh, I, I think clearly, uh, since you haven't met each other before, that maybe you could speak to, to each other after the meeting in terms of the details of this situation. But, um, I think you, Catherine has expressed an interest in speaking directly to you, and I think we could do that better when you've got more room to discuss the details. Thank you. I would Thank you. That. And I've got two councillors waiting, uh, Councillor Crog and then Councillor... Uh, 
The other panelist. One of them. The other. One of them. Um, I just wanted to address the, the, the comments about uh, everyone decides their own level of protection or tetanus shots, that type of thing. We're not even talking tetanus. Um, BC Ambulance Service provides um, uh, immunization for its members. Um, uh, I believe fire departments do, um, everybody does. So you're bringing in volunteers and paid staff. We're talking everything from like hep B shots, that type of thing. I'm not talking tetanus, um, but it should be offered. You say uh, people can make their own arrangements for whatever they think they should have. No, it should be a corporate policy that anybody that's volunteering or paid to volunteer will have opportunity to access these at no charge to themselves because it can be grossly expensive. Thank you, Councillor Crockett. Councillor Moslin. All about bloodborne pathogens. Yep, thank you, and thank you very much, Catherine, for, for coming in today and trying to uh, clarify this. And uh, you know, Mayor and Council, uh, the Mayor knows that I've had this discussion with him before. There's a critical need for housing on all spectrums in this community. A huge amount of money is poised to invest in our community from BC Housing and private in the development of this. I am apprehensive that we are leaving a lot of that leadership in the hands of a volunteer society that may or may not yeah. form. And I believe that responsibility should be rest with council, and the mayor knows this. I've heard that argument. Yes, and I, I have, you know, I. I really congratulate you, Catherine, for take, for stepping in. Like a lot of newcomers, you recognize needs and put yourself there. Thank you. But I guess my question to you is, and to council, because they know it's going to come to me eventually. Should the leadership be provided be provided by city council? Would it be better provided by the council through a select committee? Or should we rest the case in the hands of volunteers? Thank you. That's such an unfair question. I know. In it, in it, I, I, um, answering questions that start with should are always difficult for me. Because should is a, it's a, a, a word that we use, that we're using to defend something that we already believe should happen. And I use it a lot. My husband corrects me constantly on should. But, but um, I'll just say this, I, I am open, I am not saying that, that this group, and I'm sure if you, if you really heard what I said, and I can read it again because I thought it out quite well, if you heard what I said, I'm not, I'm not chastising you, sorry I'm sounding like it, um, if, if you heard what I said, I did not say that we would do this. I said that city, <coughs> in the last sentence, as well, city council has to say, has to say, that a society needs to be formed and a visioning process begun on what a Grand Forks housing society may entail. And I'm not saying that, that our working group, they are truly a working group, they are not a visioning group. And they have come to understand that because every single person on that committee has specific jobs and they are reporting back fastidiously to me as an umbrella in this group to support back and let each other know. But I'm just saying that, that I, I'm not closed to city doing this. I, I'm, I'm not at all. In fact, personally, I, I will say personally, this is not where my board is sitting. This is not because we have not discussed it further than saying, yes, we are interested in looking at this. Personally, I feel the only way that it would ever succeed is if city council decided to do this. And that's, you know, I don't know where Brian sits on this. We haven't talked this, this in depth about it but that is my feeling because the more people are involved in any sort of project that needs to move ahead the better it's going to be and and we need the investment of everyone in this city and you know I, I looked and looked and looked um, on City Council when you all took your uh, vow or whatever it's called your uh, oh. being councillors in this city and I couldn't find it I couldn't find what you actually said 
but I have been to other city council and uh, and government times when people are inducted into different groups and you make a you make a vow you make a promise to care for the citizens of the city and these people are all citizens whether whether they're paying taxes or not like what is the definition of a citizen definition of a citizen is a person who lives within the confines of that city and and we all have a responsibility to care for them and and all of you here whether you're paid or not uh, are responsible for making the city a better place and I truly believe thank you <laughs> I truly believe that um, that you didn't run for city council to put different groups down or to separate or to cause division I believe that you truly ran for city council and are on city council because you care about everybody in this city and you want to make Grand Forks a really great place to live Okay, ladies and gentlemen, um, <coughs> pardon? No. Um, again, I'm, I'm going to have to wrap this up at this point. Uh, Mr. Hansen has the last comment here, and then uh, I'd like to wrap it up. Well, having had some experience in the past with uh, this subject, uh, unless the city has a strong involvement in this, uh, you're dead in the water. <laughs> BC Housing will not. Uh, uh, go forward with funding without the blessing of the city, and so you've got to you've got to be on side uh, as strong as possible. Thank you very much, Mr. Hansen. But and, did fund it. To, to, yeah, and I think the issues here are subtleties in terms of whether the the city is or supports. We obviously support, I believe, a strong entity that controls housing and plans for us in the community. We're not the social housing council. There are a lot of options we can look at, including one from the city of Calgary, where it's a separate uh, corporation <coughs> run by the city, but uh, as a wing of the city, uh, wholly owned by the city, right up to having a, a strict nonprofit society evolve within our ranks. So there are a lot of options out there, and I, I don't deny that the city has a responsibility to make a decision here. So I'd like to leave it at that for this afternoon, for this morning, still morning. Thank you very much, Catherine. I appreciate that. Um, and we are running late here, but uh, let me just touch a couple things that, since Director Russell is here, who's also the chair of the regional district. Um, the regional district has been doing their best understanding the pressures that Grand Forks is under to keep our um, uh, burden in terms of shared services as low as possible. And it, it is mentioned very often. There's a couple of things that are coming forward that are increases in cost, but the kind of increases in, in particular, I'm talking about the floor in the uh, 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 swimming pool that has been put off probably for seven or eight years has reached a point now where there are danger issues and health issues. It's the kind of issue where Roby and I are the only two voters on it, but I, at this point in time, see it as being ready for our recovery program. We need to have an attractive town. This is one of the things that we can't deny, and although for us it's about an $80,000 increase in that neighborhood, it's really a four hundred dollars to $600,000 project, much of it coming from reserve. But those are the things I think, in terms of how I'm voting with Roley on our shared services, where I'm looking at the fact that we still really need to start with an attractive town if we're going to move towards recovery. So, uh, and I appreciate Roley not putting me on any committees since I'm fragile in age and, and, and my busy responsibilities here. Uh, but, you know, we have a lot of um, attention to the uh, landfill by uh, Rowley who sits on that committee. Um, so we're well covered at the regional table and I can tell you now they're doing their best to keep the cost to Grand Forks at a minimum. Rowley? All right, thank you. Uh, I was not born in the, the parking lot either. Uh, <laughs> my mom was in labor for 36 hours so we had lots of time to get to the hospital. <laughs> <laughs> You're younger than I am. Yeah. Um, Thank you very much, and thanks to the council for uh, inviting me to be here. I appreciate it. Uh, I, in, in recognition of time, I do have a few pieces. I will try to get through them very quickly. Happy to answer any questions. Um, first is clarity in terms of why I'm here, and a reminder. I, I'm here as a peer to the City of Grand Forks, as a representative <coughs> of Grand Forks, and to make sure that that's clear. So 
my role here is not as the chair of the regional district, it's as the elected representative for Rural Grants Works. And the idea being that we can really, uh, there's a lot of projects that we work on together. We need some avenue or opportunity to share some conversation about those. Um, since I think you guys are probably keen to get going, I will go to number five first. Uh, that would be forestry and just a, uh, again, thanks for the presentation. A recap on, I think one of the pieces that is valuable for us to think about as City of Grand Forks and Rural Grand Forks, uh, we've been working over the last few years to really build the, the kind of um, communication and, and consultation role between uh, three ways, between local government and provincial government and the forest industry. And I feel like, you know, relative to where we were five years ago even, uh, we've made a lot of headway there. And I think that's an important piece for us to think about and, and maybe for your council to think about is, is where best, where are, the, where are the points in that process where we can add value. And one of the things that you know, might be value, valuable, you know, I hear if we're looking at a forest stewardship plan, maybe we ought to push the provincial government to be able to give us a bit of a, a, a guide as local government to say what kind of feedback do, do the, does the industry really want from that forest stewardship plan, things like that. So let's let's be clear about what kind of value there is there, and and have a conversation that involves the the, the players to be able to get to some productive end. Um, uh, so uh, another piece on the housing front, um, I would just remind us all that uh, urban matters at the uh, at the end of last year as a as a community. Uh, Community Contribution Company, I think is what they're called. Uh, they made a, a, a very generous donation of, of uh, essentially their profit from the last year to our community in order to help us navigate some of these housing issues. And so there, there is a, uh, an amount of money there. That, you know, the vision as I understand it is to help uh, basically fund some staffing to help navigate and coordinate between our various uh, uh, housing Group, so people that are involved in, in, in housing issues. So that's, that's something for us, again, as local government to think about. Um, the, the main piece that I wanted to speak to today is just a, 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 is an update on the community center conversation. Uh, the last, last council uh, entrusted Community Futures and myself to kind of guide that process in terms of what, uh, what that community center kind of the process, not the, not the decisions about that, but the process or what that, the, a community center might look like. Uh, a bunch of those initial hurdles have been cleared <coughs> now at a point where um, we have expressions of interest from, we've received some funding to go forward with the, the much more detailed kind of uh, investigation of what that community center would look like uh, and what needs to be included. That expression of interest, those expressions of interest I think have been received now uh, and now we're at a point where we would go back out to, to those, we would uh, shortlist some of those uh, those those agencies and ask them to deliver a full uh, a full proposal essentially so that would ideally that would be wrapped up within about a month it's I think it's really important for you as council to, to, to think very seriously about uh, you know what what are uh, the kind of the key pieces that matter to us as a council in terms of what has to what that what does that has to have to look like in order for for us to want to support that as local government both for city of Grand Forks and rural Grand Forks because I think that's important for us to know before we forge ahead and, and spend that money, even though it's not our taxpayer dollars directly, to know what, what is success out of that project, so to speak. What, what did that look like, and what would it look like for us to support it <coughs> going forward? Um, the other one I would say is that uh, just a, a reminder again, an update on the fact that we have been going through a revision to our economic development uh, kind of service, the way we develop, deliver economic development. I know you guys have been very active at the City of Grand Forks as well. Uh, there, there will be a, a new service that involves just the City of Grand Forks and rural Grand Forks, which will give us a lot more agility in terms of being able to make decisions about economic development. Um, that piece aside, one of the real values I think out of that process is going to be the the uh, designation of a of a, an advisory committee, so to speak, whatever that's called, an advisory committee that helps guide us as local development about. Uh, about those decisions from a group that is populated by the people that actually know the, the, you know, the businesses that, uh, in the community, people that have a stake in economic development. And so that process hopefully will, will be moving along 
and that's kind of an exciting outcome to me to, to help guide our decisions so that, that we have a, a good flow of information from the people that know uh, know what they're talking about frankly with economic development um, trails master plan just a quick update uh, so we, we've been uh, coming behind a little bit that that process stalled uh, again I'll, I'll, I'll blame it in large part on the flood in terms of just not having the energy to put into that uh, the trails master plan we went through the first phase uh, which was basically data collection the second phase and the third phase are, are really the consultation phases that's to me as as program forks representative that's the key part of the whole process is is that consultation that's that's the value there to me um, we felt like at, as the, the at the, the uh, boundary community development committee level we felt like we needed to make sure that there was uh, enough of that consultation accounted for and budgeted for. That's part of the hang up now, is trying to figure out how, if we have to amend that budget. And if we have to amend that budget, is that money, can we get that money from the province of British Columbia, or do we have to bring that money to the table ourselves to make sure that we're doing enough consultation in phase two, even though we've already made that decision to move into phase two. Um, and then uh, the agricultural and food security plan, that piece, just to remind everyone again, that has been wrapped up, that's concluded now. It'd be great to have a, a, a little, with the new council, have a, maybe an a opportunity to dig into that a little bit, and identify what, what kind of uh, recommendations are in there and, and set some kind of plan for implementation going forward. And uh, lastly, I see Chief Harriet's gone, but fire service, uh, we're overdue, as you know, you have a contract, the City of Grand Forks contracts out to Rural Grand Forks for fire, fire service. Um, I think that it, it, uh, there's some value in having a conversation about converting that into a service and whether or not that makes sense. And I don't have any kind of vested opinion or interest in that, but I think we should look at, at whether it makes sense to continue on this contract basis or whether we should uh, go into the process of saying this is a defined service instead of being a, a contract relationship. I think it protects both parties, basically. It protects the city grant forks and the grant forks. And that's all. All right, thank you, Roly. Any questions? Around the table? Hearing none, you've covered it really well. <laughs> thank you very much for attending, Roly. Thank you. Um, Uh, we'll deal with the next item anyway. I'm just looking at the fact that we're supposed to take some pictures here this morning at, at 10.30. But the next item on the agenda is the uh, Wildlife Wild Safe BC program for 2019. Uh, so what we're looking for is to, uh, for Council to recommend the support for this and submitting a grant application for 2019 season. Our share of that cost is about 8500 um, and uh, I'm open to discussion and motions. Councillor Thompson. I will make that motion. Motion's on the floor. We don't need a seconder and discussion. Councillor Zublinski. Um, just one comment. There's this one, there's a couple other issues on our agenda today uh, about spending dollars before we've had any discussion about budget. And um, I hate to commit us to something without even talking about the budget for so Right, and uh, although we apply, I would still think that if it if we can't afford our share, that we can stop that at a critical point before we pay it. Okay. So, your if I understand that there's a, a deadline, and that's the reason why for the granting process, I believe it's uh, the end of January sometime. I'm not sure exactly what the date okay. is, but that's the reasoning why it has to. Um, um, if council wants to partake, participate in this program, we would have to get the authorization before the granting fees. So. so this is just a clarification. Are you speaking against uh, approving going ahead with the grant? No, I know. I, and to be clear, clear I'm, I'm in favor of this program. And, and it's just good clarifying. It, it's just the process as far right. as doing budget stuff before we even talk about the budget. Gotcha. So, uh, so I might even suggest a. Uh, well, again, like I said, we can we can apply for it. You can tell us we've got it, but we don't have to do it. it yeah, and I guess that's where I'm going is, is make the motion that uh, we give staff the, the ability to apply for it and see what happens. Right. Okay, and that's the motion on the table. Councillor Thompson, made. any further discussion? All those in favor? <coughs> okay. Let's see. 
Uh, monthly highlights from department managers and uh, did anyone want to speak to this? If not, I'll just open it for questions. You worship by uh, usually uh, you can, uh, if there's any questions we ask, uh, council asks the questions prior, but I think we have a lot of our managers here, so if there's something specific that um, needs to be asked, we can try and answer. Okay. Um, questions on the reports? Councillor Zielinski. Um, thank, you, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, under boundary flood recovery, uh, the very first bullet point, uh, Chris Marsh uh, confirmed as deputy recovery manager. Um, who in that group does it confirm? Um, gee, Rowley's gone. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm assuming at this point that Graham's it would here. be Graham. Graham's here. So, so your worship, oh. uh, as far as the, um, the area, there's the management team that works as the the piece that, that determines the recovery manager's piece, and so it was a, um, an area that was blank, like it was, it was sitting open, it was vacant, and so there was a definite need, I'm sure Graham wants to elaborate on that, and so from the regional side, um, we, we have Graham here from the city side, and so Chris would be from the regional side, and then they back, backfill Chris's position with an interim um, on the regional side. Um, does that answer it enough for you, Councillor Zelensky? So the way I'm reading this one is confirmed by regional district. Is the answer is that you confirm it based on? It would be, yeah, because it was a regional employee. Okay. So a regional employee, that's who would have formally uh, accepted Chris. Wayne, Chris. Okay. Any further on monthly reports? Yeah, on on boundary flood recovery. So I I, I know who Chris Marsh is. Uh, who's Mark Stevens? Is he a regional district employee? Right. Can you? Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, so yeah, Mark Stevens is uh, um, he uh, applied to the regional district posting. Uh, he's a former manager at City of Trail, where he's involved in infrastructure, and uh, he was heavily involved in our EOC during the flood last year, and was also in the RDKV EOC during the 2015 uh, SIGPIN and um, Rock Creek Fire. So he's, he's got an extensive emergency management background as quite a bit, as well as quite a bit of uh, uh, GIS um, and geographic information system and uh, infrastructure planning work. So uh, it's a year and a half to two year posting at the RDKB and, and uh, a good opportunity for, for Mark to join on the team. <coughs> emergency <coughs> Operations Center. That's right. Thank you. So, another question, Mayor, if I yeah. may? Go ahead, I'm, I'm just okay. looking at last night. Thanks, Mayor. Okay, well, and congratulations on getting the DMA off. That must yeah, be like a huge down. weight off your <laughs> shoulders, hey? Here Way to go, gang. Thank you. Uh, um, so, okay, Mark Stevens is a uh, our regional district employee. So, I guess my concern is uh, is emergency preparations uh, for Fresh at 2019, uh, an emergency flood response plan, or I'm not too sure. We need to get the public involved in that to allay their fears. When can we look forward to having that? The 26th. Is that not the, the next uh, meeting with the community? I'm uh, sure the, uh, the mayor, the, the next public meeting is on the 24th. Um, and uh, uh, Paul Edmonds, he's a consultant who's uh, um, working with the regional district on the flood response plan. Um, he's right now working on the public engagement and communications aspect of this uh, plan and something will be coming out in terms of the various opportunities. We're looking forward to, of course, using um, uh, at, at the appropriate times our, our recovery um, public meetings for sharing information, but there's going to be some specific meetings that will be arranged and also some public events uh, to discuss preparedness and um, you know even have some instruction on proper sandbagging um, as there was a few a few issues with what came forward. So I uh, look forward to some uh, details on what the public engagement will be in the next couple of weeks and I expect also some engagement directly with council as part of the pro project. Right, thank you, Graham and uh, Mr. Johnson. No, no, I'm just, <coughs> no, just waiting. You're getting lonely out there. <laughs> just moving the camera. Okay. Yes. Uh, so I, I just wanted to. Um, I think there was a couple members of council that asked about uh, the preparation for the uh, 
South Brockle Armament, and um, and I believe that Mr. Reed uh, is prepared to speak a little bit about that. I know that um, uh, Councilor Mosman came in and he got got some first-hand information, but I think it's just good that maybe all of Council and, and the, the participants here just have kind of an yes. idea of, of okay. what's happening. Go ahead. Thank you, through you, Mr. Mayor. I just wanted to touch briefly on the, the DMAP, as was mentioned earlier. Um, we put in the expression of interest uh, in July, and it's it's been a, a long haul to try to get that put together, but just wanted to point out that uh, Pam uh, worked on the, the property piece and working with the province, and Kevin was uh, working uh, with us to try to put the, the document together and do the wordsmithing in the application and um, and Mike Cassidy uh, was hired to to help uh, backfill my position and helped uh, a huge amount on the EMAF grant application with the engineers and just trying to get all the information together. We had uh, Norix uh, Engineering A uh, and E uh, group or part of Nor or part of A and E. Uh, you know, and they worked weekends and over the holidays and evenings. So it was it was really um, terrific to, to see the group come together and and put together such a, a package that we could be very very proud of. So just wanted to thank everybody for that. Um, it ended up being uh, about 871 pages that we sent in. So it um, should have. Uh, Lots of detailed information and, and good information. So, uh, just wanted to again thank thank everybody that took part and helped out with that, um, and and Rosemary with the mapping and, and different aspects there. So, real team effort. It sure was. Um, and just a bit of an update on South Ruckel. So, again, we've been in conversation with the province. We've had uh, numerous. Um, site visits and, and conversations about it. Uh, we had the land surveyors uh, doing <coughs> a natural boundary um, survey and uh, topographical survey over the holidays. Uh, we had the section 11 started. We put in the archeological assessment with the Swiss Indian Band. Uh, they've since requested uh, a bit of an extension. So I have a meeting with them uh, and Graham next next week. So we're going to go over and uh, kind of discuss the project and the urgency and um, why it would be tough for us to grant the extension that was requested for that specific site. Um, the land application uh, is currently underway. Uh, environmental management plan is uh, being worked on, I believe, this week. Uh, we also. I had a few conversations with the Deputy Inspector of Dykes and their engineering team. Uh, we had the EAF for the engineering and the permitting approved uh, previous to Christmas. And then we had the uh, EAF approved for the riprap. Uh, and we found that out over the holidays. So that's terrific news there. Uh, so we're just we got the rough quantities uh, for tonnage for the project last week, so we're trying to secure the materials this week. And uh, as I say, we're we're moving forward on the project, but we've we've heard some good news, and uh, it's it's gonna again be another tight timeline with lots of work to get it done. But uh, right now, we feel positive that uh, we should have it in place. So great, thank you. And questions, Mr. Reed. Mr. Zielinski, Councillor Zielinski. Um, so, so under, sorry. so under the staff reports under financial services at the at the bottom, um, it says uh, surveying for South Rockwell Rockwell Dyke assessment. Uh, that's um, all complete then. Um, just can fill in some of the stuff. What was, what was the date assessment? And was this the one we were just talking about with the, with the uh, date authority? Through you, Mr. Mayor, the um, surveyors had to go out because of the avulsion that, that took place in that area. So we lost a lot of land, so they had to go re-survey re the, uh, 
the top of Pank or the natural boundary. Um, so we're looking at getting a, a report from them. Uh, it's supposed to be there Friday, so I'm hoping today it's in uh, with the topographical survey and the, the uh, new legal survey so that the engineers can design to that new natural boundary. Further, Councilor Mazel. Yeah. <clears throat> yes, thank you, Mayor, and uh, and thank you, David, for all this work. I mean, this, uh, a lot of us are really wait. We're gonna have our fingers crossed on the South Bank, South Rock Harbor, and done. It's such a complicated job. It looks so easy to many people, but you start talking between grant applications and permits, it quickly gets really complicated before the machine even gets to the site. I I, I want to ask you another question about water and sewer. Uh, I uh, looking at the report about the water leak repairs on six and the abandon and it says the abandonment of an old four inch weight of water main. How are you able to abandon that water main? How did that happen? Thank you. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, that was for the Habitat for Humanity. The had some city land that was donated to yeah. build the new okay, house there. Yeah. and it it was looped uh, so it wasn't um, I, I mean all our water mains we try to loop them so we don't have stagnant water in, mm -hmm. in the ends of the mains and so that was one area that was looped just up to the top um, so from 73rd just to that alleyway on 8th street so we had to remove that uh, the reason we had to go to the highway was that's the next valve uh, where we could shut that off. And then that valve uh, failed. So we had to replace that valve. So we removed it off the highway, put it on the edge of 8th Street and Central. And then in doing that, there was a valve on 6th Street that failed trying to shut, isolate the, the one on 8th Street off. So we had to uh, isolate that one and replace that one. So Detail. So thank you, David. Mayor, I guess I, I want to just draw attention to that. These bits of water infrastructure are 60 years old? Depending on the neighborhood. Yeah, yeah 50, 60. And they are, they're, they're, they're fragile. And I am concerned too much that if we put away our, our capital uh, infrastructure plan, to set it aside that the, there will be a in order to respond adequately to the flood that we will be turning we will be holding our breath and hoping there will nothing be higher else risk. breaks down fine thank you mayor there will be higher risk i think we recognized that when we started looking at our asset management plan to to find the monies that we found thank you very much mr reed uh, okay can I have a motion to accept the monthly highlight reports? Councilor Gorlick and uh, we don't need a seconder. All those in favor? <coughs> uh, we're down to proposed bylaws. Uh, you can see the first one here is that um, we need to move this forward to the January 28th regular meeting in terms of of uh, fees and services having to do with water meters primarily. Can I have a motion to that effect, Councillor Thompson? Any discussion? Councillor Zelensky? Um, yes, I, just a few questions on, on the numbers here. Uh, in, in our staff report, uh, we've got uh, three bullet points on that first page. A revenue target of 950,000, yeah. and then there's two other uh, bullet points in behind them. Yeah. It, those other two bullet points, do they add to the 950,000, or are they uh, uh, separate? I'm not sure what he's asking. Can you help? <laughs> Through you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Um, these are. Those other two points are the assumptions that were made in determining the rates. So um, I, what I did was I looked at the actual water consumption for a one year period ending with the latest billing and assumed that the actual consumption would be 25% lower.
and that will account for any leakages that are in there and the fact that people, once they actually start getting billed for their water, will probably, re or hopefully, reduce their consumption. Um, and the other um, item that, that I excluded was there's about 100 properties that, uh, as a result of the flood, are not being built. So right. I've assumed that there's no revenue from those properties in coming to the rates that, that we've determined. So this is a, a conservative approach. So um, if those properties come back online or if the water consumption stays the same, then our revenues will actually be a little bit higher. So. So, um, so looking at past budgets, uh, the revenue from the water service has never gone really about eight hundred thousand. So, what what you're telling me is bumping it up to nine fifty is because of the twenty five percent reduction and the loss of accounts. Is that what I'm hearing? That's what I'm hearing. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, actually, revenues, uh, the budget for water revenues um, last year was. 946,000 originally and it was reduced as a result of the flood and not billing those flooded residences. So a 950 is consistent with the budget of last year. That's just a little more clarification. So so back in I guess it's September 24th of last year uh, an alteration to the, to the and, and, and if you want to put me off to this, our uh, conversation this afternoon, it's great. But uh, it has water services and it has uh, expenses of uh, 822000 for the budget for 2018 and, six, eight, uh, and 787 for, uh, for 2019. So I'm just trying to get these numbers. Can this be better handled with the workshop we're having this afternoon? Yes, I think so. Okay. okay. You're with us. Okay with that. Yeah. Councilor Moslem. Yes. Thanks, Mayor. Another question on that. Now, my understanding of this is that 50% is going to be based on consumption. Now, 50% is going to be based on fixed rate. Can you describe to us what some of those fixed rates are? What are, what are people have to pay for, even if they don't use the drop of water? <coughs> I hate to go through Mr. Mayor. Um, well, the, the, the rates are actually all in the um, in the bylaw itself. So for a residence, that fixed that flat rate portion is forty dollars uh, every bimonthly, so two hundred forty dollars a year. And then depending on the size of the service, it goes up proportionally. Right. So you've got that in your report. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay, I, I, okay. I'm just trying to. The bi-monthly fixed charge, what is that forty dollars paying for? I'm not, I'm not Having the hookup. Having the hookup. Well, continue. It's like a parcel service. Tax. Yeah. You pay in it whether you do you build on it or not. Okay. Okay, council. So we're passing this on to the uh, meeting of the twenty eighth of, of January and the motions on the table. All those in favor? Remuneration expenses for council. Um, let me speak to that a bit. I have asked that there be one addition in here that, that you don't see, but this is what was left from the previous council's decision. But I would like to see us have a, uh, a local uh, allowance for using your own vehicle. As you can see from my performance, and I'm seeing from councillors' involvement here, you're hooking into uh, the city in ways that interest you and make a lot of sense in terms of our support and reflection of the city's needs. It means you've got to go out to meetings, you've got to go to various things that are uh, drawing you out sometimes three or four times a week. So what the regional district system is, is that you get a $50 car allowance per month or you can file your uh, mileage. So you have an option there. If you have a really busy week, you're filing your mileage, uh, and if you're not, you're still getting the $50 allowance to have your vehicle there to do these things. Um, that's a regional district approach. Uh, comment? Is it one or the other yes. regional district? One, so one or the, it's one or the other. 
I mean, I know what I'm asking you, which is, you know, keep doing what you're doing, which is your, rather than me assigning you to do things, you're finding things that really draw your interest. You're connecting into them, but when you've got to go, uh, uh, Councillor Corlick, to two or three meetings and drive back and forth, there's, an, we need to, because we have lost some ground here in terms of the way the government has changed the whole remuneration package, I think the mileage part would really uh, indicate that we're not an office board, we're a board that's out and involved with our community. Councillor Zielinski. Uh, what I'm going to suggest, Mr. Mayor, is uh, going to our um, new bylaw that the previous council just passed. And uh, number six uh, suggests a, a committee being formed to look at the expenses. So um, I would suggest that we go that route. And if we go that route, I'd like to, uh, one more question for that committee to, to answer for us. Too. What would that be? Uh, whether or not uh, this board, this council, can do adequate governance with uh, five, feet, five members instead of seven. Uh, didn't they try that in Toronto? <laughs> okay, uh, so the suggesting on the table is rather than make a decision, this is a committee of the whole, that we move towards the recommendation of a, of a, of a uh, committee struck to look at this. Who would sit on the committee? What was the recommendation there? Was it two community people and one staff member? Uh, chief finance, financial officer and two to four members from the community. Two to four members of the community? Uh, can I ask for any response to that from our yes. CFO? Uh, uh, yes, Mr. Mayor. I, I would just like to comment that if we were to do this, it wouldn't be able to take place until later in the year just because of my time constraints yes. with respect to the budget, uh, financial reporting, etc. So, um, And that t pretty much takes me right into uh, to the end of May. Okay, so that uh, doesn't sound like a good idea response. Councillor Thompson. Um, I hear what Councillor Zielinski is, is asking. Um, question, if we were to reduce our, our uh, council to four members and the mayor, would we lose our city status? Would we revert to a town or a village? not knowing a whole lot your worship on on exactly what the innuendos i don't think you you would lose the city status um I, I it would be something that we'd have to check with uh on the ministry to see if it's it's possible the act uh, to specify yeah um but i think it's, it's a wouldn't. certain amount like you're allowed to have a certain amount of council when you're at a certain populace to go backwards i'm not sure exactly um what the reasoning would be for having that. Um, well, without getting into debating yeah, it here at this yeah. point, I think uh, Councillor Zielinski would like it on the table. Yeah, and I'm not worried about time frame, and my understanding is just it's a change of letters patent, your letters patent with the province, if they go that right way. Uh, and I guess my only comment is that um, we've got to tighten our belt, we've got a lot of expenditures in this community, and if you're going to start cutting costs, Cutting at the top is a good place to start. Okay, um, can we live with what has been set in place by the previous council and add the mileage to it? Can I ask that, Councillor Mosler? Ma uh, yes, Mayor. Thank you. I, 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 I'm. Well, I, I guess I was humbled, a little bit embarrassed by seeing the staff report on this. Uh, the, well, what I see is the. the the decision that has made this council unique in the past is the decision to raise the value to the councillors as opposed to the mayor. That is, you're paying the councillors 75% of the mayor's salary. Uh, and I, 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 I guess we're going to have to live with that unless we give ourselves a pay, lower our pay. Uh, I can see the concern, though, where the mayor is would seem to be uh, underfunded. A anyhow, Mayor, at this point, I, I'm, I'm very, personally, I'm quite happy with the remuneration that's been set aside. I would say that what we need to do is set some, a process in place for August 2020, uh, 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 the, sorry, 2022, before it's just prior to the next election, that we repeat what the previous council did. 
I don't know. I okay. Uh, that would be my suggestion is to to look at the putting it forward a, a process that would allow us uh, as we leave council to right. set something That's in standard. place for the neck our success right. not to leave us in the same predicament. I'm I'm not I'm not feeling underfunded because councilors <coughs> went off. But I would like to recognize local travel, and I think it's reasonable in terms of the pattern of work that I see council uh, embarking on. And so I ask you again, can you live with what is on the, uh, that has been put forward by the previous council mm -hmm. and add the mileage, local mileage issue? Do I hear a yes on that, Councillor Corlick? This is a committee of the whole, so we would have to bring that forward at a, a future meeting, uh, at a regular meeting. Yes. <coughs> Councillor Thompson, so that looks like a yes can I have a motion to that effect? So we would accept what's on paper for the current uh, remuneration package defined by the previous council and add a local mileage component. And I'm suggesting that the $50 is enough that if you're, if you're going for into a busy week that you're coming back and forth five or six times to meetings that you file your mileage. That's the motion. I don't want to keep track of my mileage. Oh, and file for your fifty dollars, or or not file, and you would get an automatic fifty dollars per month. Mm -hmm. Per month. Seems like so a lot, but it's what, a half a tank of gas. Six hundred bucks a year. <sighs> Times seven, four thousand two hundred. <laughs> How does that relate to um, a cup of coffee? <laughs> Because that's how they always do it. Yeah. It's less than a cup of coffee, or it's more than a cup of coffee. That's where you buy your coffee. That's okay, while well, we're dragging out okay. here. Do you want to see Anyways. this come forward to yes. a regular yes. meeting? Yes. yes. All right, yes. there's a motion. Councillor Thompson makes a motion. Yeah. All those in favor? All right, direction sufficient here in this case. Okay. Okay, up and running. Does that require a bylaw amendment? No. I'm saying yes. no. Uh, to her. Yeah, well. no, what is she doing? <laughs> okay. <laughs> We're moving well. on to number C. Proposed comprehensive development zone to accommodate a mobile home park and ecological reserve boundary drive. And I know there are some gentlemen here this afternoon, this morning, that uh, would like to speak to this issue. So placing it on the table, do we have anyone here to speak to it? Gentlemen? Mm -hmm. Draw straws. <coughs> and what we're being asked to do again is that uh, this would be moved to the 28th uh, regular meeting, first and second reading, so that we would recommend this to the 28th for first and second reading. Gentlemen, you're on. Can you identify yourselves for us? Uh, my name is uh, Adam Kobusu. I am the, um, uh, the developer of this project, and I also own the uh, property in which it will be situated. Thank you. Good morning, Council. My name is Brad Alenko. I'm with McElhaney Consulting. Uh, we have offices in Penticton and Asus, and uh, we're just helping uh, uh, Mr. Kobasu through the uh, planning and engineering processes. All right, go ahead. <coughs> so this um, proposed um, Maddie Patrick Home community will go on a parcel of uh, land that I own at the North End of Boundary Drive. Um, I've uh, owned the parcel for quite a number of years. I've followed the uh, residential real estate market for a long time. And in the last couple of years, it's become apparent that um, affordable housing in Granville <coughs> is in very short supply. My initial discussion about this proposed project started back in January of last year with the water sheets at Graham Watt. And through the course of those um, discussions, um, 
the suggestion was made that uh, as part of the development, we should incorporate or consider incorporating home sites that would be suitable for accommodating tiny homes. The um, end outcome of the uh, design was a combination of 15 tiny home sites and 10 home sites for larger homes. The, um, the tiny home sites would accommodate homes in the 500 to 800 square foot range approximately with a uh, starting price that uh, we were targeting to be well under $100,000. The, um, the larger home sites would accommodate typically a 16 foot wide manufactured home up to about 70 feet in length or a double wide home anywhere from 24 to 30 feet in width. And those homes could range up to as large as 1,800 square feet. So the objective of the um, proposed development was to cover, was to provide a very broad spectrum of housing opportunities for any potential tenants that would want to um, relocate to the uh, proposed manufactured home community to um, allow them basically a home that uh, could range anywhere from 500 square feet up to 800, 1,800 square feet and provide an opportunity that basically fits just about every budget and every housing size need. Manufactured homes today are built much the same way as conventional site-built stick homes. They're, they've got two by six exterior construction, uh, they've got high insulation values, they've got pitched shingled roofs. Exterior siding is uh, typically siding, uh, hardy siding or vinyl siding. Uh, they have four stair furnaces. Um, they, um, they basically come with the uh, same type of warranty coverage that a new home would have if it was uh, built on site. And they provide a, um, a housing alternative that um, is uh, both affordable and uh, quite attractive, certainly compared to what manufactured homes were like that uh, were built back in the 60s and 70s. Um, the uh, site that uh, the home, uh, the mobile home park development is proposed on, in my view, is quite ideal. It uh, offers a quiet, private setting, unlimited recreational opportunities, uh, such as uh, biking and hiking. It's located right on the Trans-Canada Trail. It's uh, within one and a half kilometers of the um, Savon, um, shopping center and um, it's also within an area that already has some higher density uh, multifamily housing development. Um, one, um, one final item, um, I, um, I did a survey of uh, available housing in Grand Forks at the end of December and what I found was there were only seven residential listings under $200,000 in the entire community, both in the city and in the rural areas surrounding Grand Forks. There were 12 sales in 2018 of homes under $200,000, of which seven were mobile homes, and uh, there was only one mobile home at under $100,000. That was uh, a sale that took place at $71,000 for a 42-year-old home. So what we're proposing for uh, the Boundary Drive site is um, an opportunity to fill a void, uh, offer homes that are available for under $100,000 for the tiny homes and offer full size homes up to potentially 1,800 square feet for $150,000 or less. Uh, so basically, it's an opportunity that um, I feel is um, lacking in Grand Forks at the present time and which the uh, proposed uh, manufactured home community that uh, we want to build at the end of Boundary Drive should um, hopefully start to fill a need. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you. Comments, questions? Councillor Thompson? Yes, I looked at this development and it's, it's, it's quite exciting um, and I'm particularly pleased with the dedication of the uh, wetlands um, to the city. 
Is it your intent to to um, have paths that you rent out to people with manufactured homes? And is it your intent then for the tiny homes to build them and resell them? Um, well, the, yes, the intent of the, um, of the um, development is the, uh, all the home sites will be rented. So that, the, uh, one of the main functions of that is to reduce the housing costs because you don't have to buy the lot. Um, you're basically going to be paying monthly rent. Um, all of the homes, whether they're tiny or what I call full size, will be manufactured in a plant. So they're going to be built in a controlled environment. Uh, they'll be built undercover. They're going to be dry. Um, walls aren't going to be buckled. Uh, so everything that, um, that will be built for that development will come out of the factory. Including the manufactured homes? Well, they're, they're, they're basically manufactured homes. So manufactured homes are built in a plant yeah. and uh, they're built in a controlled environment. And the, uh, the tiny homes, they will likely be 14 feet wide by anywhere from 36 to about 56 feet in length. So roughly 500 square feet to about 800 square feet. And the, uh, the full-size homes, uh, they're if a person is looking at a single wide home, that would be a 16-foot home by anywhere up to 70, 72, 74 feet in length. Um, the sites are wide enough that you can have a 24 or a 27 or a 30-foot double wide. Uh, so basically, you can have a home on that um, one of those sites up to about 1,800 square feet. If, you know, if you desire to have something that big. Certainly won't be any uh, obligation to do that if somebody's looking for a thousand square foot home or eleven hundred square feet home. There won't be restriction that says you have to have you know a larger home. But, uh, as long as the home kind of fits within the um, the intent of the visual appearance of the uh, community, um, whether it's you know, sixteen feet by sixty five feet or sixteen feet by seventy four feet, it doesn't matter. Okay. Councilor Krog. Yeah, um, sort of to go along with uh, Councilor Thompson's question. So um, I was wondering, are you going to finance or build the units for people to buy? Or if I want to move on to a lot, yeah. you hook me up with just right manufacturing or whatever and they build the house for me, and then I pay like the rant to the strategy right. or whatever. It, so that's it. you're not- I'm not gonna be in developing in the construction component okay. of the home. The home would be manufactured by someone like Moduline in Penticton, or SR, okay. SRI in Lake Country. Um, you know, that's their area of expertise. Yeah. So they're not okay. gonna be built on the actual site um, okay. on Bombay Drive. The, the whole benefit of building homes like this is to have them built in a controlled environment. Yeah. Yeah. They, they go okay. much quicker, uh, there's no material waste, um, they are built, you know, they don't get yeah. rained on, um, and um, you basically end up with a home that potentially has much, uh, has fewer headaches than a home that was built on site over a period of six months. The warranty that comes with homes that are manufactured now is very much the same as what you would get for a warranty on a home that would be built for you on your own lot. Okay, we have questions. Um, Councillor Korlick and then Councillor Thompson. So, my thoughts on tiny homes are usually smaller than this five to 700 square feet. And they're often built for portability so they can be moved from one place to the other. So your tiny homes are gonna be stationary. So, on and they're gonna be on foundations and larger than with the TV shows? They're not going to be like an RV. Okay. The intent is to have, uh, first of all, there's two types of tiny homes. There's um, thing, uh, homes that are called park models, okay. which are, you know, you'll see in the Okanagan okay. in RV parks. Yes. Those are okay for summer use or for occasional use. They're not, uh, their CSA certification does not allow them to be used year round, even though probably a lot of them are uh, just because nobody yeah. uh, does the enforcement but the intent is once the home is placed on the foundation it's staying there it's not the wheels the trans 
it'll be transported on wheels. Whether it's a tiny home or if it's a 16 by 70 foot home, it's still going to be transported on wheels. The dolly's removed once it's placed on the site, it's gone, the hitch is gone, and that becomes a permanent home. Most of the homes will end up with a carport. Um, somebody you know, may end up putting a deck onto the side of the home. It's potential that there's potential that someone might want to add a second bedroom or a third bedroom or you know, a rec room of some sort to the side of the home because the lots will be wide enough to accommodate the width of an additional structure to the side of the actual okay. home. That's fine. Well, he's answered my question. Okay, so Councillor Zielinski. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I've got two concerns about this application. I'm not, I'm not too sure that tiny homes and modular homes go together. Um, so, so I have to be sold on that. I, so that that uh, the mixture um, concerns me. Um, I'm also concerned on how we're trying to get the development in the door. Um, this way of, of planning, creating this new zone, I, I would really like a, a group discussion on where we're going with this um, and where it's going to take us down in, in the future. Um, creating a special zone for special development is not good plan because then what happens to the next special development? So we, we've got to try and get it in conformity somehow in my books anyway. So uh, those are my concerns. And clearly this will push it forward to public hearings on the matter, our planner. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, comprehensive de development zones are good planning. Um, they're used extensively elsewhere. There's nothing unusual about them. And the reason that we went for that, the, the comprehensive development zone is because our manufactured home bylaws from 1977. So we could do a brand new manufactured home bylaw, um, but we did say in our official community plan that we wanted to bring in a variety of housing stock and affordable housing. So um, this is good planning, and it's done elsewhere quite regularly. Um, the other thing I just want to make the distinction about is tiny homes. We're talking about tiny homes. These are not tiny homes. Uh, these are small, small. homes. Yeah. Um, tiny yeah. homes would be considered like 12 square meters up to 18 square meters. These are not those. So we've eliminated um, our minimum home size, which used to be 800 square feet. Uh, that was taken out of the building code several years ago, so we uh, harmonized with the building code and we took that out of ours as well. These are not tiny homes, these are small homes. Um, if you go back to the 20s and the 30s and the 40s, when we were in wartime, a five, 600 square foot house was considered a normal sized home. So um, yeah, I just wanna make sure that we don't get hooked on this whole tiny home idea. Uh, these homes will look identical to their counterparts in the park, they'll just be smaller. Thank you. Councillor Thompson. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, just a comment that mm, this amendment to the zoning bylaw would not preclude any other developer from wanting to come in and do something similar. So it um, certainly would have my support. Okay, and what we're asking is to move it to the 28th. Do we have a motion on that, Councillor Corbett? Further discussion? <coughs> All those in favor? Okay, so thank you, gentlemen. Uh, we'll see you on the uh, 28th of January. Okay, so no information items, correspondence, news items, questions from the media and public. It's in front of radio man. No, it's a newspaper. No. Peter Matheson on tiny homes. <laughs> our resident expert. I think it's great that we get our jargon right because it can be so confusing, right? That we use the terminologies we all agree on. So that looks like the end of it, folks. Uh, most of oh, just moment, sir. Uh, Barry Jarvis, Mr. Mayor. I have uh, uh, just a comment, and it's on the change in the water rates, but. I, in view of the time, I'm going to deal with that by uh, in writing. So, thank you very much, Mayor. Motion to adjourn. Councilor Thompson. Okay. okay. Excuse me, Captain. Oh, <laughs> what was the?